May I have your attention, please? Um, it's time to start the tonight banquet. Um, I was expecting computer screen. I cannot see it through this. Now, today, uh, we're going to start the banquet, uh, 18th, um, what is that? 18th International Symposium on Recent Advances in Drug Delivery System, which we simply call Utah Meeting. Because it's too long, name is too long, so we simply call it Utah Meeting, and it become the most important drug delivery meeting in history. So someone came, studied all this, and we'll talk about someone's achievements as I know someone, someone wants us to have lots of fun and that's what we'll do. So first of all, let me begin slide here. Someone loved golf, although he's not good at playing golf. <laughs> Whenever he played golf, he just loved the golf course, look out the you know, scenery and contemplate all the time. He loved the golf course so much so that you know, sometimes the golf course greet him with a flower confetti. Let me go back. Can you play that be there there? You see that flowers greeting him. Although he didn't play golf well, he worked very hard. So finally he achieved a career grand slam. He won um, British Open, US Open, the Masters and PGA Championship. So he was, he worked very hard to be so successful, but he was also at the same time very lucky. So he met a lot of good friends and good colleagues. The first good friend he met was Joe Andrade. <laughs> Joe Andrade, as you know, uh, he was one of the most influential scientists in biomaterials at the time. So please go to Joe Andrade's website and uh, see what he's up to. He has done many, many things after he retired. And he wrote the novel and he, he did many things. And he reminisced someone in early days when he met him for the first time. Now, <clears throat> can you see the screen? Yeah, I was there. So, so he and someone met in uh, 1969 and as uh, Jim Anderson mentioned this morning, they studied the blood compatibility, which was one of the most important topics at the time. <clears throat> Someone and Joe lived the uh, same side of the same area of the Salt Lake City. So sometimes they commute together and he Kyung and Joe's wife, Barbara, met and bonded immediately and also their children. Kara and Alex, Alex and Kara came and Tonio and Aaron Andrade and we had a great time together. That's what Joe said. You know, if you have a great friend, great colleague, you have a great time, what else do you need? Probably money, right? Anyway, they had a great time and they worked together and both someone and uh, Joe went to Prague in 1977 Prox Symposium on Medical Polymers, that, that's where they met the young, the young Henry Kopacek, who still looks young, and Helmut Ringstorff. And then they stayed at the Russian Connected International Hotel. I really don't know what he meant, the Russia Connected International Hotel, but he stayed there and someone, was, uh, someone has an ulcer, so he asked the milk to the restaurant to soothe his ulcer and the hotel brought him gallons of beer. You know why we love going to Prague, right? So after they come back, they uh, proposed to the state of Utah to start the Centers of Excellence and both of them got their centers and someone got his center called CCCD, uh, Center for Controlled Chemical Delivery. And that's where later uh, Henry join the team and make the center so successful. So as, uh, as Joe said at the end, let's recognize, honor, and remember someone 
his friendship, his incredible work, and his creative contribution to our diverse and important field and to our lives. So uh, Joe, thanks so much for taking time to reminisce uh, you know, your early days with someone. Shortly after someone met Jim Anderson, Basically, as Jim told this morning, someone went to Jim's office, actually laboratory, and said something like this, Jim, what the hell are you doing? And Jim just described what he was doing as he described in the morning, and that's where they got bonded and started working together. And they, uh, someone met Joe Robinson later on also, they become very close friends. Jim Anderson and someone started the, this particular symposium, very first symposium in 1983. So I'm gonna show you a very short clip how it all began. Can you run this feed there? That's how it began. Now it's the 18th time. At the same time, they prepared this symposium. They also prepared a new journal called the Journal of, <laughs> journal of Control Release. Now the impact factor this year will be more than 10. And someone and uh, Jim decided to have a first founding editors, Young Fan and George Heller. Um, there's a story behind this, why these two were chosen as founding editors. Someone and Jim recognize that, that many people will complain because if, whenever their manuscripts are rejected, they'll be complaining. So they need some kind of a so-called bouncer who can punch people off. So they chose Yang Fan because he's very good at punching people. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can complain about it. They have a reason to choose George Heller because George, they need somebody who can spend 100% of their time for journal, not just part-time. So they chose George because George was able to clone himself. So the George on the left side can spend 100% to journal. <laughs> George on the right side can spend 100% to Gloria. That's how they chose Yang Fan and George Heller. And after that, they have to attract new person, Henry Kopersek. So it was a very difficult job to attract Henry Kopersek from Prague because if you go to Prague, there are several bridges, okay? And every artist comes to the bridge and draw. And everybody draws Henry. Look, look at that, Henry, Henry, Henry. Sometime popular, Henry, Henry. Henry has no reason to leave Prague. So Utah spent lots of money to attract him. Anyway, Henley, fortunately Henley came to University of Utah and that's why all the drug delivery system, drug delivery field got all the benefit from Henley and Pablo. When you talk about drug delivery, we cannot talk without Nicholas Peppers. Now, you know, Nicholas is incredibly successful. That's because Nicholas is not a human being. He's a Greek god. He's not Greek god yet, but on the way to God, he's a Greek god. If you go to Athens, please stop by Parthenon Temple. You'll see his face carved on the east pediment. So 
now you know why Nicola is so successful. When you talk about Nicholas, we cannot talk without Bob Langer, right? So this is Bob Langer and all the important people are on this picture, but somebody told me that the building behind is actually a mental hospital. <laughs> and this is a picture of the best patient of the mental hospital. <clears throat> I don't know what is best patient in the mental hospital. Is it good or bad? This is why someone is not there. So anyway, the person on the left side, your left is maybe the doctor of the mental hospital. I don't know who is on the right side. I know somebody we may know, but he has some red bow tie. I don't, it looks familiar though. Now we can also talk directly without Alan Hoffman. You know, Alan Hoffman is right here. There, Alan Hoffman thinks that he's a Terminator. That's why he always wear big sunglasses. And whenever he presents a talk or lecture in the classroom, people ask questions and his answer is always the same. His answer is always, I'll be back. So he's, he's, he's a very, very strange person, but very nice person. We will talk about him presenting video shortly later. So whenever we talk about direct delivery system, I see a lot of cool guys, okay? So whenever we talk about cool guy, this is the ultimate cool guy, the red butler, which in the gone with the wind, but direct delivery field has an even cooler guy that is him. The reason Alan is cooler than Clark Cable is that Alan smokes cigar on his right end of the lips rather than left. But anyway, Alan is a, such a wonderful person and Patrick will talk about Alan's pretty soon. Now, this is a slide that, that Teru O'Connor sent me. Uh, he sent me two slides. He, he just wanna point out that someone encouraged the young researchers is around the world in Japan, 1985, Professor Sakurai brought the then young scientist, Katsunori Gataoka Chisato, Teru Okano, Nobuiko Yui, Katsuhiko Ishihara, all of, all of them become the leaders in, in Japan, right? So it is incredible that someone nurtured all the scientists throughout the world and all they become leaders in the field. So, and the Teru also sent me another picture which the Jim Anderson showed this morning, but he had a particular sentence explanation there. He said, Someone Kim is sometimes an excellent husband. Sometimes an excellent husband. I need to explain what he means because if you don't know Japanese, you don't understand this. When Japanese say sometimes, it means always. When Japanese say maybe, it means no. You have to understand, okay? So, then you may ask a question, if Japanese say no, what does it mean? If Japanese say no to you, that means I hate you. <laughs> That's why every single visitors from Japan say no to David Granger. <laughs> now you know why. But anyway, this is Teru Okano's image. Now, not only Japan, throughout the world, someone produced many exciting scientists and many of them become distinguished professors, sometimes lawyers. We have lawyers here, right? Yeah. So and everybody's so successful. So some of them are really successful like David Granger, which I simply call danger. Yuhan Be, the senior professor, Yik Chang Guan, dean of graduate school, Kidong Park, who is here also, a dean of engineering. I have lots of story to tell every one of them, but today I'll just talk about David Granger a little bit because I have a story about him that someone liked it so much. David Granger, um, I came back to Utah many times, and last time, 
they was talking to his wife, calling his wife. His wife has uh, some medical exam, so he was checking. David said, okay, okay, uh, okay, honey. Okay, I'll see you soon, sweetheart, bye. So I told him, this is uh, not a fake story, okay? This is a partly true story. And, and uh, David said, I, I asked him, you know, it's so amazing you, after all these years, you still call your wife honey and sweetheart? That's so sweet. And David said, it's not what it seems. He becomes serious. You know he's serious all the time, but he's even more serious and said, you know, for the last several months, I started calling my wife honey and sweetheart. You know why? I said, well, why? Because I forgot her name. <laughs> <laughs> so when when <clears throat> when your husband say honey sweetheart make sure she he remembers your name okay kidong park is here he's only one from korea helen cho is here too but she's from samyang kidong is the only one everybody else from you know korea japan europe they all presented virtually but kidong is the only one here you know how much dedication he has to this symposium and to someone came. Where is Kidong? Where is Kidong? Uh, here, yeah. So, but he came here. That's not the true story. The real reason is different. He knows the problem of calling his wife honey and sweetheart. So he always called his wife's real name. But last week he by accident called his girlfriend's name. So he has, he's in exile right now. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, here are a lot of, uh, you know, students become leaders in the field. And let me show you another successful, uh, he's uh, someone's uh, protege. Before I continue, before I forget, let me announce that Hamid, Hamid there. Hamid invites you, all of you, after the banquet to the bar so he can buy you a whiskey. He will pay for it using Dean Peterson's credit card. <laughs> so you're welcome to drink as much as you want. Okay? So Hamid prepared lots of great whiskeys. And as you can see, Glenn Levitt, 12 years. Land Morange, 15 years, and so on. As you can see, there are so many whiskey, good whiskey, Glen, 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 Glen. And Hamid wanna introduce new whiskey, which is aged 55 years old, okay? The new, new whiskey is called Glen Kwan. Yeah. <laughs> Glen Kwan single malt <clears throat> whiskey. It's aged 55.5 years. In the color of beautiful blue bark, Glenn's face is upside up, but actual bottle, he has it upside down because just looking at the bottle, you're always drunken. That's what I mean. So I just wanna, oh, Glenn is now uh, Jans Carstensen, who is one of the you know, most uh, influential uh, professor in pharmaceutics uh, in, at Wisconsin. So finally, I want to introduce uh, a Samyang company because uh, Samyang Holdings, as Helen introduced, it is a wonderful company, uh, one of the best in Korea, probably in the world too. Um, the chairman, Yoon Kim, and vice chair, Won Kim, uh, have an intimate relationship with, uh, with uh, you know, this meeting, as well as someone Kim. So, when last year's Samyang also sponsored the CRS Samyang Award in honor of someone Kim. As you can see here, they are actually preparing for the future and we are always with you. You can, I don't know whether you can see that you said that we are always with you and preparing the, for the next hundred years from now. So Samyang sponsored the first award and last year, the first time the awardee for the Samyang Award in honor of someone Kim was uh, Yun Yo and uh, uh, Stephen Desmet. Okay, so those were the two recipients. Now they are accepting new nomination for this year. So please uh, nominate a fantastic young scientists who can 
represent the future of Sangwon Kim. So this is a very brief history of the symposium. Now I'd like to uh, introduce you the next speaker, which is uh, Jim Anderson. As you may have heard this morning, Jim has a lot of story. Sit down yet, not yet, sit down, <laughs> sit down, sit down, sit down, not yet. Okay, well, yeah, five minutes. Anyway, Jim Anderson, everybody knows that he is just handsome, James Anderson. And uh, his real job is a professor at the Case Western University, but in, in his spare time, using his summer vacation time, he functioned as something else. Can you run the video there? So he, he let me ask you, <clears throat> This is a scientific question. Have you ever seen James Anderson and James Bond together at the same time? Nobody has. It's impossible. That's because the two are the same. So James Anderson, here, is a good looking man. Now you can come, okay? Jim, Jimbo, Jimbo, come. He doesn't listen. Yeah, yeah I'm sure now. So. So let me introduce you, Jim Anderson. Thank you very much, Keenum. Man, you're sick. You're really bad, man. Actually, the 007 thing, we all know what James Bond had. He had a license. And you know what the license was for, right? He had a license to kill. I actually knew a person, an MD, who did his residency at Harvard and his colleagues at Harvard gave him 007 as his nickname because that's what happened to his patients. Well, I saved one or two stories from this morning. <clears throat> and unlike Keeman, Keelan, I will, uh, I will be short. I'll, I'll only make it go for 12 minutes, Keenum. Um, in the run-up to the first 1983 meeting uh, of the Utah Symposium, as we like to call it, uh, we thought we had it pretty well planned. Park City was going to be small. We knew it was going to be small to start with, but we thought that would be okay. We had a nice hotel there. And uh, we thought we had everything covered. And unfortunately, the, the reservations were slow, really slow. And of course, we didn't have instant communication with cell phones and computers and all of that jazz at that time. But Sung Wan and I were on the phone. And Sung Wan, I mean, I, I could still hear it. Jim, Jim, the reservations are not coming in. Should we cancel? Cancel. No, Sung Wan, we know they're going to be slow, especially from the industry people, but they will come. You built it, they will come, of course. Well, as it turns out, indeed, they really did come, over 80 participants. And in fact, we filled all the rooms that we could possibly get at the hotel and elsewhere in Park City. And there were people that had to stay at hotels here in Salt Lake City and drive up to Park City for the meeting. And that's how successful that meeting really was. But the story doesn't end there. We had gotten seed money for this meeting from the Dean uh, of the School of Pharmacy, uh, Dr. Harold Wolf. And once we found out, or once he found out how successful the meeting was, he wanted his money back. Uh, those of you that have seen Sung Wan upset, you know what I'm talking about. Very rarely. Well, we had to go back into the smoke filled room again and have a discussion on this. And I don't know how it was resolved. But uh, 
let me just say, I don't think Sung Wan opened his door to Dr. Wolf much after that. Well, that's the end of my stories. And now I'd like to introduce another one of our favorite friends, Jan Feyen. Hello. Hello. Hello, Jim. Jan, good to see you. Nice to see you. The floor is yours, sir. Um, <clears throat> can you see me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have uh, the five minutes I saw. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank Kinam Hamid and all local organizers for this excellent meeting. Uh, dear Hek Jung, Alex, Kara, friends and colleagues, it's now two years ago that Sung Wan passed away. I have many great memories of Sung Wan. He was not only a great scientist, but also a great and generous friend. He loved his wife and children and always told me proudly about their achievements and how they were doing. For tonight, I have three very uh, crazy short stories. When I went for the first time to Korea to visit with Sung Wan, his former, uh, to visit his former professor at Seoul National University, I learned something about the Korean language. Outside the old main building for chemistry, we heard the sound of a cuckoo bird. In Holland, we hear the sound as cuckoo, while Sung Wan told me that in Korea, it's buku, buku. Uh, when I now hear the cuckoo, I am still confused, but it reminds me of our first joint trip to Korea. The second short story is when Sung Wan visited us in Holland at our ESCDD conference in the hotels of Oranje at Noordwijk aan Zee, he told me that he had lost his luggage. Sung Wan went to his room and Joe Robinson, George Heller and others were waiting in the lobby. All of a sudden the fire alarm went off in the hotel. A few minutes later, Sung Wan came down in the lobby without socks. He had washed his socks in his room and tried to dry them on a lamp in his room. The socks caught fire and the fire brigade arrived. The next day, we had to buy some underwear for Sung Wan and Sung Wan tried to pay with his credit card, which at that time was not possible in many shops in Holland. Of course, we helped him to get the underwear. Then during my trips to Salt Lake, I stayed many times in the beautiful home of Sung Wan and He Kyung. I had my own room with paintings of Van Gogh and many times used the Mercedes of He Kyung. I saw Alex and Kara growing up and went to their marriage parties. He Kyung always prepared a very nice breakfast for me, and we discussed many subjects, including how to maintain the roses, how to culture orchids, and how to prevent the deer coming into the garden. When Sung Wan and He Kyung sold their home, it felt as if it was the end of a very happy period with so many good memories. Dear Hik Jung, Alex, and Cassie, Kara, and Brian, I regret very much that I was not able to come. Hik Jung thanks again a lot for having me in your house as a member of the Kim's family. Now I like to bring out a toast on the memory of our dear friend Sung Wan. Prost, they say in Hilda and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much. Prost. Thank you, Jan.
It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, and uh, it's uh, Henry Kopacek. Uh, Henry, because Keenum took all of your time, you, you get 15 seconds. <laughs> And can I get the slides? Yes, in memory of Sung Wan Kim, he was really a great scientist, a great teacher, and a great man. I first met Sung Wan in 1977 at the symposium in Prague, which he and Joe Andrade attended. And uh, we were close since that time. Once I moved to Utah in 1986, we, have, we had adjacent offices. Then I could follow him and we were close every day. Then I have numerous memories of Sung Wan Kim. He was an excellent speaker who would be invited to numerous conferences. He was a family man, a great father, a great husband, and great grandfather. And uh, even if Kinam Park talked a lot about golf, in his younger ages, he did other activities too. <laughs> this means he was a wise man and not only a scientist, and he enjoyed life. Here you can see. Uh, uh, Jan Feyen, Teruo, Dr. Nakatomi at our uh, patio. And this is Sung Wan hiking because somebody brought a, a, a sofa to the top of the hill above the Guardsman Plus in Brighton. And then we decided to check it out. And we went hiking there. And I remember many other hikes with Sung Wan. A special one, he took us to the North Korean border and we hiked the mountain that we could watch from the distance, the Diamond Mountain. And that was a great trip. And also a nice story. My first outing with Sung Wan was in 1982 when I visited first time University of Utah. Then Joe Andrade and Sung Wan Kim tried to convince me that Salt Lake City is not only a good place to do research, but also is a nice place to live. And then upon Joe Andrade's suggestion, we went, high, we went camping into the Wasatch Mountains. And uh, Sung Wan clearly was not a camper but he did it because he knew I would appreciate it. He was always trying to be compassionate with his friends. Uh, we traveled not only in Korea, but also in Czech Republic. That is from the trip in 2000 before the symposium at the Institute of Macromolecular Chemistry. And Sung Wan looking at the mountains, thinking about life. And uh, again, Kim, Kim, I'm hiking before golf. <laughs> That's how years go. I put the, that Jan Feyen, can, Jan Feyen can see it. That's how we looked 25 years apart. Uh, still enjoying life even at the older age. Sung Wan had numerous friends in the scientific community around the world. Here is Alan Hoffman at one symposium. That's Professor Nikolai Prate from Moscow and Sasha Kabanov from the University of North Carolina. That was another nice occasion uh, and both uh, Sung Wan and He Kyung uh, are enjoying themselves celebrating the 60th birthday of Dean John Morgan. And this is uh, 
uh, from 2019 when we had a, a workshop organized by the Korean Academy of Science and Technology in Salt Lake City. And uh, that was the uh, opening evening dinner. And uh, that's Professor Mooney from Harvard, myself, Professor Peppas, and Sung Wan Kim. Unfortunately, the next day, Sung Wan didn't feel well and couldn't attend the meeting. But now they are two of the most personal photographs I have of Sung Wan. He was always passionate and supportive. This means this is a photograph from 2015 where he tries to encourage me. I just came back from hospital after six hours brain surgery and visited my office first time. And this is from 2020 when Sung Wan was introducing my lecture on February 8, 2020. And uh, 16 years later, unfortunately, he passed away. Then Sung Wan will live us forever. Our lives have been shaped by his wisdom and legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have the slides, please? Uh, dear Alex and Kara, Mrs. Kim, all of you here, we are gathered here tonight to remember Sung Wan, his life, his contributions, and really how he touched upon all of us. And uh, I really would not like to say anything more except to say you've heard already how many friends he had. This is the group that run drug delivery. It doesn't happen anymore. I know the young generation is happy to have a few friends and then they look at some others as enemies who do the same thing as they do and they will get them their NIH money. That was not the practice 45 years ago. We were all working together. Um, this first slide is from something I presented about 20, 15 years ago. It was the history of CRS. And in that, the slide was, and then came Sung Wan Kim of Utah. Because indeed, before Sung Wan, there was really mostly materials and drugs mixed together. And we were going, as Jim Anderson says, down to Fort Lauderdale in July, 100 degrees and 100% humidity. And we were sitting in the bar all the time until we had to give our papers. And here came Sung Wan Kim very mild character, always coming in. Nick, have you checked the recent work on hydrogels? Does the water become free or is it bound? He was always excited about free and bound water. From the days of Yesenitsky, 1976, he knew his science very well. I don't want to talk so much about this slide except to point out that he was really the main force behind the stimuli responsive materials. Others did them as well, but he was doing them very well. And always molecularly, this was the leftover from the period with Henry Eyring. And I'm about to talk a little bit about Teruo, but first I want to tell you how I met him. I met him in 1978 in some meeting. I don't remember very much. We were all together, probably we were drinking. But the first real meeting was in 1981 at the International Society for Artificial Internal Organs. It was in Paris, I say. And in that meeting, there was this young man, and I don't know if he's hearing us tonight, Teru Okano. He had just finished his PhD at Waseda, and he was trying to find a postdoc position. And he was talking to many of us, and he talked to Kim, and the rest is history. He became the postdoc in that particular meeting. It was a wonderful meeting. We went out for several meetings and so on. 
And then I invited him to Purdue for a seminar. This is a 1972 picture that probably only Keenan will realize, recognize the pharmacy department was at the very left in this particular picture. And he came and gave an exquisite presentation and we were excited. And then we went out for a big steak in town and so on and so on. So at that time, Alex was probably 16 or something like that. And you start thinking, where is Alex going to go as an undergraduate? He liked Purdue because he liked Midwest and it was quiet and it was nice. So guess what, poor Alex in 1986, I'm sure, he came to Purdue University for his freshman year. That's all he lasted. He couldn't stand it. <laughs> and he decided, well, it's, you know, we had enough of Midwest. Let's go back to the West Coast. And so that's fine. But these were times we were interacting a lot. At the same time, as you know, the Utah meeting started. The Utah meeting. Nobody has shown these pictures. I'm surprised you guys don't keep your, your literature anymore. These are the cover pages. The very first one up on the left is from Park City, Utah in 1983. I still have all of them. Someday I have to donate them to somebody, maybe to this department. And they came every year from the very first time. I don't know who had drawn this particular diagram, but it was a very nice diagram. It was like an osmotic system releasing or something like that. And as Jim very nicely said, some of us were upset. Why the heck are we going to Park City, Utah? Why don't they do it at the airport in Salt Lake City? We went to Park City. There was a small hotel. There were many of us and so on. And soon Wang and Jim had prepared the sessions. And there was a session that was a little bit more mathematical, let's say. In those days, polymers, drug delivery, we had a lot of mathematics. And the session finishes. And people are coming out agitated. And a little while later, someone comes to me and says, Nick, what did you do in the meeting? What did you tell them? I had, in my famous old days, I had unfortunately attacked a colleague. Thank God he's not here tonight. And this has remained. There are many people that still remember that day. And uh, many other exceptional stories for Park City. Two years later, we decided to do it in uh, Salt Lake City downtown at the old Marriott with the, the, the mall next to it and the ZCMI on the other side. It was a wonderful meeting and we kept learning a lot. And then Yang Fei Yan said, let's do it also in the Netherlands. And we did it in Norvai Gamze. And I remember it because either the first or the second time we went to Norvai, we came back in the same plane. It was a KLM plane, it was kind of Chicago, I remember, not to Salt Lake City yet, not connected with Delta. And soon one and I were sitting next to, we drank, I don't know how many beers, and it was magnificent. We had analyzed the whole world. And uh, here it is a Korean and a Greek talking together. I mean, these are not two countries you would expect that would interact. interact. And then Kin and then Sun Wang said, we have also a present for you. What is that? Kinam Park. Kinam came and gave an interview and we hired him and we were very well together. I have this picture, which is much later for one reason. Look at what Sun Wang is showing. He's showing a picture of him running with Henry Eyring. It's that I don't have the original, although you've seen it here. And it is a wonderful picture, shows really how Eyring was really uh, uh, excited about all his students that he had. This picture is from about 30 years ago, and it was in the 60th birthday of Alan Hoffman, who will talk to us in a little while. Younger days, in there you can see also Henry Kovacek, as I remember her and Pavla, and of course, uh, Jan Feyen. Great days. We were getting together to discuss the future, the future. And we were already interested in solving diseases. And soon one, it was in the middle. I remember once I was in the panel discussion for one of his proposals. I don't think I ever told him. It was an incredible proposal. I had no problem giving him an one. And one, I mean, this was really a perfect proposal, but he had some great people working with him. This is another picture that I like. It's from Portland in 2010. 
the Control Relief Society decided to have fellows. And this was the first time they elected fellows. Sun Wang is somewhere in the back. I think he's next to Kinam, third from the left. Yes, Kinam and then him, and then to the very left, Gary Cleary, and so on. A wonderful meeting and very nice recognition. One thing is, Sun Wang was always active in everything, but he never ran for president. Smart man. He could really tell us what to do and do it well, but he didn't want to be a president of that. And uh, this is another picture that is particularly important to me because you see Sun Wang Kim with his mentee, Kinan Park, and with Vince Lee. And this is very important for those of you who don't know it because Vince Lee and Kinan Park were PhD students of Joe Robinson. And Joe Robinson for me is one of the best pharmaceutical scientists ever existing. The way with which he was talking to the younger generation was incredible. And these were his two PhD students who at the same time were editors of the JCR and pharmaceutical research. Think about it. Think about it to see the impact that this whole gang has had in the field. So uh, uh, this is from a more recent thing, about 10 years ago. I remember I came to this meeting late. Teruo was telling me, where are you? What are you doing? And we were celebrating. Uh, it was the 15th meeting of the, of the organization. I love this picture. And I think somebody brought up how uh, this is the sixth international meeting on intelligent drug delivery. And you can see Keenan and Hesun, I think, and uh, his wife. Actually, he's, he's her husband. She's a scientist and a very good scientist, an excellent scientist. And of course, Kim. And this is one of the last pictures. This is from the Korean meeting that we had four years ago, where suddenly he didn't feel very well and he didn't come the second day. I remember that meeting because there were only Korean and American uh, colleagues. It was the Korean Science, a Korean Academy of Science and Technology. And it was in that meeting, we were sitting in the corner and I was talking to him about certain things that we were going to do for the Korean Academy of which I'm a member, the first Greek to be a member of the Korean Academy. And he was always directly saying, Nicholas, Nick, if you can do something about the World Congress in 2024, please do it. Well, Kidon Park is here and he knows that we did it. The 2024 meeting of the World Congress of Biomaterials will be in Tegu, uh, Korea. I hope it will be still. No virtual meetings, real meeting. But, and frankly, I didn't have anything to do with it. Although I was president of the International Union, I was not voting. But I showed people that Korea is a wonderful place, very, very hospitable. I have been there quite a few times. I have three former students who are professors over there. And uh, Sung Wang was giving me some hints. Don't tell them this, tell them that, tell them that. So the vote was almost unanimous. <laughs> the United States voted against it <laughs> because they had San Francisco. But we are going there in 2024. Uh, I will always remember Sung Wang Kim. Uh, he was somebody who helped me, uh, gave me some great ideas about the future, about hydrogels and so on. And uh, we will remember him forever. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce a video by Bob Langer from MIT. It's really... I heard his voice, but... an honor and a pleasure for me to pay tribute to my great friend, Sun Wang Kim. I've known Sun Wang, I knew Sun Wang for um, well over 40 years. We first met actually in New Orleans, as I recall. I remember there was a controlled release society meeting and when I'd be walking down the street, I'd probably Bourbon Street with him along with Jim Anderson and 
and Jan Fagan and and you know we we just really hit it off and such a wonderful person and uh, you know for me it was an honor as a young professor to be with such distinguished people as the three of them and uh, and over the years uh, you know we continued our friendship uh, it's interesting I was reflecting on this that I've been to Korea three times all those three times were because of Sun Sa Wong one time he asked me to speak to Sam Yang. Uh, for uh, the, their anniversary. Um, another time they had a big symposium for her 60th birthday. Um, and, uh, and the third time uh, he and others uh, arranged for me to get an honorary degree uh, in, in Korea. And, and he was just uh, always just such a warm, generous friend uh, on all these things. And, you know, I, I he would come, I, when I, I think my lab and others, uh, uh, Nick Peppis, you know, they'd have, uh, uh, and Yolk and Cohn and others, they'd have uh, conferences with me when I was, um, you know, 60 and 70, and he always came and was just so generous in every way, uh, you know, and and, uh, and when we'd have uh, the meetings uh, in, in Hawaii, um, where, uh, you know, I was chairing with, the, the, which we would do jointly with a lot of our colleagues in Japan, he would always come and give a wonderful talk and you'd always see him, you know, sitting around, you know, mentoring young people, talking about companies and science and, 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 and so forth. And he, of course, started a wonderful meeting himself uh, with Jim Anderson, the Utah meeting. And I remember going to that quite a number of times. And of course, this is uh, what we're, we're here for as well now. Um, but it, he was just, just like I say, a great friend. He's also a great scientist. I mean, he is, if I look back at all his contributions, they're enormous. He was one of the first to develop glucose responsive insulins, one of the first to develop uh, pH and temperature sensitive uh, gels. He made many other fundamental studies uh, over time. I mean, he uh, was widely published uh, in really top journals and would repeatedly get top NIH grants and he was nice enough to be on NH study sections uh, reviewing grants. I mean, he was just a super scientist. And I should add, not only was he a super scientist, he was a super entrepreneur. He was one of the first people, in fact, he was a role model for me uh, to start companies. I remember him starting Theratech, uh, which was a very successful company and one of the developing new skin patches and uh, transdermal patches and others. He also uh, started Macromed and Expression Genetics and. And, and really just uh, an outstanding entrepreneur, somebody who made the world a better place, created jobs for people, and, and was very, very successful at it. He was a great family man too. I know I'm talking on him to so many occasions, you know, I was just so proud of his children, Kara and Alex, and of course his wife, Hayden. And I, I, I just think he uh, was just, uh, you know, wonderful person in every way. and. He certainly contributed a lot to uh, the United States and our nation, both in terms of training great people, but also in repeatedly being on study sections for the National Institutes of Health and other things. Uh, he would win enormous awards for all the things he did. One of the very few people to uh, be elected to both the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and, and I think he was just, uh, um, you know, and many, many other awards, too, too many to mention. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, he's widely honored as he should, should have been and, 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 and is today for so many of the great things he did. And finally, that I, I should add that he was an absolutely wonderful mentor. I consider him a mentor to me, uh, but he also mentored many great people, both in Korea and America, uh, you know, B.G. Ree, Cheok, many others that uh, he would mentor over time. And uh, he was just a great role model and, 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 and really a great, great human being. I, I just always will have a warm place in my heart. I know my wife, Laura, shares this. You know, he is a very, very special person and he always will be. I mean, to me, I'm sure to all of you, uh, so I just want to say how honored I am to give this tribute to really my great, wonderful friend, Sun Wan Kim.
really one of the great people that I've had the pleasure to know in my life. Thank you so much. Ang Trap, who was Thank you, Nick. And uh, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to introduce Alan's remembrance. Sung Wan was also a great friend, teacher, and mentor of myself. And I remember back in the 1990s when I first met Sung Wan, of course, with Alan, and he visited our group. And he introduced himself as the little brother of Alan. And I needed a DNA test. But uh, I think in spirit, they were brothers. And so we had a lot of fun making this video. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process. It took about three visits to see Alan. He's living down in Tacoma now, which is south of Seattle, and about 12 hours or so for this five minute video that you're going to see. The first visit was a bottle of wine and I found so many old photos, hundreds of photos that we spent three hours looking through and enjoying with all the people that you've seen up on this podium. And I realize it really is a special generation that you've had. I'm a little bit jealous of it. I'm so glad to be connected to it though too. We got it down to about 60 photos through a lot of hard work of myself. And so I gave him the assignment for that week until I could come back the next weekend to get it down to about 15. So I came back, he had another bottle of wine waiting and he still had 60 photos. And so, during that bottle, I did get him down to 15 photos. And I said, this week, all you have to do is put the captions on. So the next week I came back and there were 30 photos again. And he said, just tell Keenom that 30 minutes is okay for me. Keenom, you owe me a whiskey because through video editing, editing, I let him go, I let him talk, and I've edited it down. I had to speed it up even, so I hope he doesn't sound like a chipmunk. And the one piece of advice I gave him was, don't every slide point and identify every single person in the photo. So you can see how successful I was now. But we can play the video and you can see beautiful Alan's tribute to Sun Wan. I was very touched by it myself. First of all, I'd like to thank Kinam for inviting me here and for, to thank the whole uh, Sun Wan Kim family um, who are here to help celebrate his life and his career. It's very important to me. It was 37 years ago that we all got together and Sun Wan invited us to talk about biomaterials. And uh, you see most of the people who were there at the first meeting, and uh, many of you will recognize most of the people there. Uh, next slide. We had a trip to China in the late 1980s, and Sun Wan and I really enjoyed that together. We kind of hooked up together and went down the river called Lee River in a boat together. And this is a picture taken on the main boat that went down that, uh, that uh, beautiful region, region of uh, China. And we enjoyed it so much. This is a very historic photo. In 1998 in Salt Lake City, there was a meeting. Again, Sun Wan, the only guy without a tie here. Well, the, the only guy among all the 
VIPs <laughs> without a tie. That's typical someone. Um, his mentor, Joe Robinson, Jim Anderson is there. I don't remember his name. That's me and Sun Guan and Yan Fan, Taro Wukano, and one more. These early people. This is a wonderful meeting for, especially for me, and it's a reflection of Sun Guan. There he is, his generosity. He organized a meeting to celebrate my 60th birthday, and that uh, was in Maui in 2002. And um, here I was with Yan Fan lighting cigars. Those were the good old days when you could smoke. And here is a funny statement because Sun Wan was very, very uh, accepting of everything. But he says, waiter, can you get these smelly cigar smokers away from me? <laughs> he was, Sun Wan had such a great sense of humor and he is also um, very uh, open to everything. He never, uh, our, uh, he never um, complained about any cigar. <laughs> Another photo at a meeting that Haibon Lee ran at his institute, really uh, near the uh, Lucky Chemical Research Labs. And there's Haibong, and you recognize many of the people in this photo, Sun Wan and myself. And um, again, remember how many lucky times we had together <laughs> meeting over the years. There's Terrell right there. Is that, you, want, you want me to say something? No, else? that's good. And here's a very historic photo because uh, we have in it Bob Langer and uh, Ikata, who is retiring. And that's a meeting that they were running in Maui. And Sungwan and I joined that meeting. And so we have sort of the four biomaterials guys in one photo. It's a kind of historic photo. Another historic photo with some of our best friends and uh, over the years, and uh, you'll rec recognize. And this is important because Sumuan was a family man. He loved his family, he adored his children, and uh, really respected the whole idea of the Korean family. And this is a great picture of Sumuan and his son, uh, Alex, in Salt Lake City in, uh, in 1990 something. But it's a great photo. You see how serious they are? <laughs> No, family was a very serious thing for, for Sun Wan and very important. And this is another great family photo. If you go from here to here, they're all Sun Wan's immediate family. And his daughter, Kara, and uh, her husband, who is there, right? Yeah, <laughs> Kinam. And there's Kinam, and there's BG Reed from Lucky Chemical. <laughs> We miss Sun Wan so much. And these are a few photos that I had together with him over, over the years and uh, a great remembrance. I would say a few things about Sun Wan that I wanted to remember and to tell you about. First of all, he was a great listener. He would love to listen to your, your ideas and then he would surprise you. Most people nod their head and they go off and say, nice to see you. And then he surprised you and he'd come back and he'd give you more ideas based on your ideas. And this is one of his wonderful characteristics. He was a great listener and he always responded to what you had to say to him. Very smart and brilliant ideas that he came up with that I never could imagine. Where, where did you get that idea? That's great. He's thinking all the time. This is the, the great thing about so on. And usually he was one step ahead of you in his thinking. He had great chemist. He loved his, uh, his uh, colleagues in field, but he especially loved and adored his family. Sun so Wan is somebody we will all miss so much. That is great. No, I think you can get a sense of it. It was a special time with Alan and he, he truly misses you all. He wanted me to tell you that and he wishes he could be here. And yeah, it's a little touching for me. One of the other great things about Alan and Sung Wan was the connections that they made 
between Korea and the United States and in our drug delivery field. And for me, that has so enriched my life that I'm sort of part of the Korean mafia in a way. And I, I couldn't say how much that's meant to me and to Alan, and it goes across generations. And so I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker who's become a great friend of mine who was a PhD student with Sung Wan. Uh, and these kind of connections I find, you know, as I get older, just an important part of life and, and such a wonderful part of our life, not just scientifically, but just culturally too, so. Ik Chan has a, a video, I believe, too. Hi, everyone. This is Ik Chan Guan from KIST, Korea. Tonight, I want to share some words that I learned from uh, Dr. Kim. I was a PhD student in Dr. Kim's lab from 87 to until 93. There are a few words that I did not try to memorize, but remained in my mind after 30 years, I got a PhD in Dr. Kim's lab. The first one is when people introduce you as Dr. Kwan is a nice guy, or Dr. Kwan has a good personality, and don't make a smart face, because this means that they cannot find any particular success in your research. So please look back and think about if your research is in a good shape, and recheck if you are in right direction. Second one is, you may have many ideas arise every day, but you cannot make them all a real project. So please think many times before you launch a new project. The third one is, when students are not doing good, don't blame them. It is because it means that your students are in wrong position. So please try to relocate your student in different projects. So everyone is doing very well when they find the right position. The last one is to put your materials in clinical trial is a very special gift in your life. So when you design your research, always mind if this is a meaningful work when you go to in the clinical trial. So with that, I shared his words and thank Dr. Kim and I wish Dr. Kim rest in peace. Thank you for listening. Well, lastly, uh, I would like to uh, invite Dave Granger up. Dave Granger was a PhD student, another one of the uh, amazing international stars that Sung Wan has produced. Uh, he is the one though that rose to become chair of his professor. And so I think Dave can tell us how well that went. Have the first slide, please. Thanks. Well, so I anticipated this being a, a late evening and my position here in the in the pecking order. And I tried to then think about things that are different that other people have not covered. So let me touch on three, three things that I think haven't been covered so much. The first learning that I had from my advisor was that, so here's, here's how I teach. Um, quiz question, everybody quiz, wake up. Anybody know the title of Sung Won Kim's PhD thesis? Everyone talks about physical chemistry. Everyone talks about Henry Eyring, but did anybody know what he actually did? Johan knows, but 
anyway, I'll just cut to the chase. It was this surface tension of binary liquid mixtures. Here's Sung Won Kim's first paper, 1968, from PNES. I won't, I'll spare you the details. But I think the short story for a person who arrived here really penniless, without a lot of English skills, and told by his mother, you know, go forth and survive, was that he was a survivor. And I think that he realized that despite working with a potential Nobel Prize winner in physical chemistry and getting his physical chemistry degree, as a master's student at Seoul National University that this probably wasn't the future. And I think that as a survivor, then all of the anecdotes about who he then did work with soon after finishing his PhD in 1971, he moved to Don Lyman's lab. Don Lyman did nothing with liquid mixtures. Then he worked with Pim Kolf. Pim Kolf had nothing to do with liquid mixtures. And then he, as Jim Anderson talked to you about, he worked with platelet adhesion and with thrombosis and then polymer chemistry. None of these things he ever was, ever was taught. And so he was a survivor. So that's so the first thing I learned about him was that you can take your learnings, but a PhD degree is exactly what is taught you to be, is it to be a survivor. And as an intellectual survivor, you should be able to navigate rough seas and in fact move laterally across fields and become things that you never thought you were going to be from your PhD in binary liquid te uh, theoretical calculations of surface tension. And so I think that I have become that in part as a, as a kindred spirit in terms of moving across dimensions in which I was never trained and not being daunted or intimidated by learning new things. Very important message was this versatility in being a survivor. And he taught me that. Uh, the second anecdote, a little more humorous, was that he learned quickly that I was very good with English writing. And I was perhaps maybe better than most in the lab. If you look at Jim McRae, he's barely literate. So <laughs> the, the point is that, and as for comparison, he would run down the hall and someone kid would bring me a manuscript, a sheaf of paper of 40 pages and a red pen. Like I didn't have a red pen and I didn't own a pen, but he would run down the hall and give me a pen and a sheet of paper and say, correct the English, I'd like this tomorrow morning. And I did this for years and years and years. And he discovered that things that were absolutely unpublishable in his English language became very publishable if I helped edit them. This became then a trait that was passed to every single postdoc and Teru Okano and visiting professorship in the lab. And so now it's become that my name is basically cited in the acknowledgements of hundreds of papers of people I have never met who have then presented their manuscripts to me and sent me a red pen and told me that Sung Won Kim said I could do this for them. And then Teru Okano eventually told me that, you know, Dave, this costs $100 a page in Tokyo, you, you know, and you're doing it for free. I mean, this is awesome. So I've been doing this for 35 years and my name appears in the hundred, hundreds, hundreds of, of acknowledgement sections of papers that were absolutely unpublishable. And so I'm not an author, I'm simply in the acknowledgements. All right, fine, that's the price of doing business. Third anecdote. So this is 1987, and we have Sung Won Kim there, not smiling, with Sung Jun Kim and Harvey Jacobs. And Harvey Jacobs comes into the picture as the person who sat next to me for most of my PhD career in, in the lab. And he taught me a lot. Um, but one of the stories was that Dr. Kim was very confused about being the father of two American teenagers when he was a Korean and traditional Korean with, I don't know what the relationship with Hee Kyung was as a mother, but to address the table here, um, he would always come in and in the morning, if I was sitting there, he would say, oh, Dave, um, how is your wife? So this is my wife on my graduation day and I have this child here who's actually coincidentally his birthday, 36th birthday is tomorrow. Um, but he really respected my wife, Holly. And he would really, call, every time it was like, oh, Dave. And, and I would say that in addition to not understanding golf very well, his English competence was also quite odd. And he would say, oh, Dave, how's Holly? As if this was the break into something else that he needed to talk to me about. So in this particular regard, he would walk into my office and he'd say, Dave, how's Holly? 
And I would say, oh, she's okay. I don't remember her name. I think I call her Honey. I, I don't, yeah, thanks for reminding me of her name. So um, he would then say, well, Dave, so I have a problem with my teenage daughter and she's 12 years old and she doesn't do math very well. She's very upset about math. She doesn't want to talk to me about math. I think she should do math very, very well. And so I need your advice. Actually, I need Holly's advice about how you talk to a 12 year old American girl about doing math. So then it became the proposition that I should be her math tutor. Do you remember this, Cara? I became your math tutor. It was a very unpleasant experience of N equals one 30 minute session where I decided I was completely unprepared to be a math tutor for a 12 year old mili militant, rebelling teenager, American female. I, I had no idea what this thing was in front of me. It was not something I recognized as human. So she has then since grown into an unbelievable woman that had I known from that 12 year old at the time, I would not have recognized. But it became now my wife's job to understand how is to negotiate a 12 year old teenager and teach her math as a tutor. I, re I resigned in that position. The second anecdote was when Harvey, the guy who sat next to me who graduated with me, brought in the newspaper, circled in the sports section. And I don't know how Harvey found this, but there was this thing in the sports section, in the auto racing section, about Alex Kim and an Audi winning the citizens race at the Warren Miller Speedway on the Thursday night citizens challenge. And I had, Harvey giggled to me and he said, I can't believe this, this might be the Alex Kim who's at that point, maybe not even old enough to drive. I don't even, were you old enough to drive? 15 years old, 16 years old. He had taken daddy's Audi without daddy's permission and gone to the Warren Miller Speedway out in Tooele, which is like 40 miles away on a Thursday night. That's a school night. He should be doing his math lessons with his sister and won the citizens rally with the dad with dad's sports car and made the papers. And I don't think you told your dad about that because in fact, when Harvey giggled, circled this in the newspaper, walked down to Sung Won Kim's office and told him, wow, is this your son in the newspaper? All of a sudden, Sung Won Kim comes bustling back and it became, Dave, how's Holly? <laughs> and I had to go back to my wife and ask my wife, how do you deal with a 15 year old who just took your sports car and won the citizens race without permission on a school night 40 miles away? So anyway, those are the stories I have that I thought should be shared that no one else had shared yet to date. And I had an incredible experience. It's been a wonderful ride. I uh, appreciate all the stories in the room today and my affiliation with all of you. And the anchoring point, of course, is Sungwon Kim. Thank you very much. I want to do, introduce now the final speaker, Dean Randy Peterson. Remember, he's the guy whose credit card's going down at the bar for everyone who wants to drink whiskey including that Glenn Kwan 55 year old vintage. So. Thanks Dave. And uh, thanks to everyone who has presented. This has really been a remarkable day uh, from the first session this morning uh, through these uh, tributes this evening. We've heard just spectacular science and such moving recollections and tributes of a Sung Won Kim. Um, I've been truly just inspired and uplifted by the stories and made even more grateful for the very brief three years that I got to interact with uh, Sung Won and jealous of those of you who had lifetime of experiences with him. I was sort of reflecting before dinner that, you know, today has really uh, uplifted me and inspired me and made me want to be a better scientist with what's left of my career and a better human. And as I uh, thought of it, I was reminded of a, a quote that I'll just uh, end with here from Henry David Thoreau. It says, on the death of a friend, we should consider that the fates have devolved on us the task of a double living, that we have henceforth to fulfill the promise of our friend's life also in our own to the world. I know that I'm gonna leave this uh, 
day in this conference uh, wanting to do that, to carry forward uh, the passions and the humanity that Dr. Kim uh, taught us. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. And I think I'm turning the time back to you. Well, thank you very much to everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Alex and Kara come to the podium, but not yet. I did. Um, you heard the story about Alex driving a car at age 15. To tell the truth, someone was worse when he was a teenager. I mean, nobody knows it, but that's the spirit that he came to America with nothing in his pocket and he survived. And no wonder why he has been so successful in raising two children too. Someone's success is not his own. He's supported by his wife, Higyeong. Without her, someone is nothing. Trust me, husbands are nothing without wives, right? Wives, everything. So someone has a good wife, good children, and Alex, Alex is everything I want to be. I really <laughs> like to you know, steal my father's car and go to the driving range somewhere. But unfortunately, my father didn't have a car at the time. <laughs> anyway, Alex and Kara, come to and talk about your dad for a while. Hi everyone, I'm Kara, um, Sungwon's daughter. And um, yeah, I think, uh, well, as you can see from all these stories tonight, uh, I had a very colorful childhood because all of these people you heard from tonight were very present in my life. And um, I don't remember the math tutoring though. So it must've been really bad for me too because I wiped it from my memory. But I remember Dave as a PhD student and Jan Feyen was at our house all the time. I think I even asked my parents if he could be my Christmas present one year. That's how much I loved having Jan at our house. And um, when I was in graduate school at the University of Washington, Alan would meet me for coffee regularly. And we just had interesting people in our home all the time. And I feel like I've benefited from that so much. Um, Henry and Jim, and you know, there are so many people that came to my wedding and, Jim, the card you sent our older daughter, Madeline, when she graduated from high school was so kind. And she actually pinned it on her desk and it's right in front of her every day, which is, um, it's just really great. Um, but when I think back on this, I think my dad relationships were everything. I mean, there was all of his science and all of that, but relationships were really important. And he taught both of us that building, maintaining and really valuing relationships is the most important thing in life. And I think from all the speeches tonight, you can see that he, he succeeded in that very well. And he also always talked about um, acknowledging and kind of showing gratitude for the people that helped you become who you are. And I would hear about Dr. Zhang, who he got his, he did work with at Seoul National and um, Henry Eyring. I would just hear about these people all the time. And then all of his friends, um, and how much they added and kind of made him who he was. And um, along with that, um, I think he, he had an immense loyalty to the University of Utah. I think he had a, a big connection with the university. And I think until, until his death, he was always thinking about what he could do to support the university and help the programs there grow and, and keep the work going there. Um, and his generosity with the University of Utah showed in so many other ways. The other thing I really learned from my father was that generosity and giving back is really important. And I saw him do that all the time. From the time I was little, I would see him um, collaborating with other scientists. I would see him talking to his students and friends and trying to help their careers. He would talk to my friends, my husband, other people, always trying to help and make connections. and. Basically, he was one of those people that lifts the people up around him. And I, I really value that. That was um, something that I learned from him. Um, and then last, 
um, my sister-in-law, Kathy, who's here, um, she was really great and helped me clean out his office after he passed away. And we found a note on his desk, a handwritten note. Um, and it was a quote by Mark Twain. And it said, age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. And at first it made me, I was really kind of shocked and I felt really sad because I never thought of my dad as someone who felt like he was getting old. Like he had so much life all the way until the very end. It kind of made, it made me, I mean, I think Kathy and I were both a little bit sad that he might've felt like he was getting old. But then thinking about it more, um, I realized that that quote exemplifies him in so many ways because until the very end, he had just kind of the energy and spirit and curiosity of a young person. I mean, he was just always, he, could, he it's like he thought he would never die. And this was kind of hard for my mom sometimes because you heard about him getting sick on different trips and we would always be so stressed every time he was going to another symposium or something, but he just wanted to live life to the fullest. And, um, and I think he had a kind of optimism that I really miss. And that, that's what I'll take away with me. So, and I wanted to just thank the organizers. I mean, Dave met with us, I think a couple of days after, was it a couple of days after my dad passed away, but what was gonna happen? And he's been so helpful along the way and it's so hard to plan with COVID. So thank you, Dave and Hamid. I don't know where, Hamid, thank you so much for planning this. And I'm sure it was a lot of work and to the rest of the planning committee we really appreciate it. And I know my dad would have loved to have been here. As you can see, he loved to meet with people. He was actually planning his 80th birthday, probably a year before his 80th birthday. You were probably invited already to his 80th birthday. And unfortunately he never made it to his 80th birthday, but he would have been really happy to be here tonight and to hear everyone's thoughts. So thank you. Well, we, we didn't prepare anything and I was just thinking through the night what to say and she basically just said everything. So, um, you know, I'm, it's, it's kind of a late night and I think we'll, we'll save everybody giving a, a long talk here. Um, just, just a couple hours and we'll be out of here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting two years since he passed away. I mean, he passed away right at the start of the pandemic. And it's, you know, it's just been a lot to absorb and really figure out. Um, one, one thing I know for sure is that he wouldn't have handled the pandemic very well. Um, I mean, those, I mean, everybody knows him well here. And I mean, you can't imagine him always having to wear a mask, you know, and social distancing and, you know, quarantining, not, not going into the office. I mean, he would not have handled this very well, not traveling, you know, staying at home. So, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's been interesting just thinking the last two years, how he would have reacted to all this. Um, but, you know, this, this symposium, it's, it's really, it's been amazing tonight watching this, you know, with the technology and the, the, the videos and having people, you know, come in by Zoom. It's, you know, it really shows how, you know, this, this can be a success. Um, you know, with my father, you know, it's, you can look at his resume and the, the scientific and business achievements, you know, his, his passion for research and everything. But, you know, after seeing tonight, you really realize what was important to him what were um, all of you, you know, his, his really his friends. Um, my memories from growing up, my first early memories are really of you people. You know, and just, he was always so proud of you, you know, bringing you to the house, you know, always talking about the great achievements that all of you are making. He was so proud of it. And, you know, that's, that's what was really important to him and really made me realize that seeing this tonight. Um, just, you know, the collaboration and the community and, you know, this symposium is really you know, a big part of that and shows the, the collaboration and what can come out of this, but it's, it's the, the community that was important to him. Um, 
you know, it's and and the loyalty to the the university. So, you know, I we we really appreciate um, your having this and putting this together. I mean, it's been really hard for, you know, the last two years, you know, trying to put this together and you know, it, it really has been a success in my mind. Um, you know, I hope that you're able to keep it going. You know, I was talking with Hamid earlier about this and, you know, hopefully this symposium can keep going every two years, maybe next time in Park City. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you everybody, uh, you know, especially the organizers, the committees, um, everybody that spoke tonight, it's, it really touched us. Um, my mom is at home watching this on the video stream. So, um, you know, we really appreciate it. That reminds me. <laughs> One thing for sure that my dad would have done at the end of his speech, if he were here tonight, is he would have thanked my mom. She's watching. Yeah. Hi, mom. I don't know where the camera is, <laughs> but um, she was definitely his rock. And, you know, I don't, I don't know how well any, you know, some of you got to know her, but he loved my mom and she was definitely the person that kept him grounded and she was who he went to for advice. And um, I'm sure that he would have, she would have been the final person for him to thank. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Kara, remind me uh, one thing that I forgot to mention. <laughs> he young, uh, graded uh, high school in Korea, Gyeonggi High School. My wife graded the same high school. And there are some, whoever graded from that high school has same character. I was talking to someone one day, you know, my wife was very upset with me, but she doesn't yell or angry, but she doesn't talk. And yet she gave me a, made a breakfast, lunch, dinner. And someone started laughing, me too. And we talked about the same thing. Everything is the same just because high school, I think. So someone asked me, what do you think made them to behave like that? So I said, I don't know, but as long as we have meal, do you care? So all the wives out there, when you're angry, don't yell at your husband. Just don't talk to them. Don't make any meal for them. Okay? They need to get trained, okay? Um, to me, someone is just having a long trip. He's traveling around the world, around the universe, and he'll be back at some point, and you all see him again when you go to heaven. It's me that I worry about because I have no chance to go to heaven because I have done many things I was not supposed to, like uh, making fun of David Granger. But then I know someone, he'll look around heaven and say, where is Kina? There must be a mistake. So he'll get out of heaven and find me and then buy me a nice dinner as he used to. He just bought me a dinner, play, pay for golf, even pay for karaoke, everything. So I will have a great time with him. And even if I'm not in heaven, having a great time with someone, that's a heaven. Think about it. So we all see him again. And someone, as I know, you will say to me, Kinam, don't charge Dean Peterson credit card. <laughs> because he has a lot of place to spend. So someone, I'll pay for it. Don't worry. And Hamid will use his credit card. <laughs> so thank you very much for everybody for tonight. And as I mentioned, all of you are welcome to the bar. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you.